Hello everyone and welcome to your Glassnode on Chain 101 where today we're going to be looking at the navigation of market tops and bottoms. And really what we're trying to do here is assess Bitcoin's natural volatility. We see that we generally get overextensions both to the upside and to the downside. And what we're trying to really assess here is what does confluence look like? When do we see a number of models that are telling us a similar story and have historically signaled overheated or undervalued markets? So as noted, Bitcoin has this natural volatility. It tends to be quite a responsive asset. It moves very, very quickly and very fast, both to the upside and to the downside. And what it generally does is it extends beyond what we would otherwise call fair value, or you may hear the term mean reversion. So some kind of typical average performance, something like the 200-day moving average or some on-chain indicator, which typically trades around the middle of Bitcoin's general price history. Now, during these market cycles, whether it's a very, very exciting bull market or the depths of a bear, generally speaking, prices will extend away from that mean. And what tends to happen is it generally springs back towards that average. Over the long term, there's these models that it tends to move back towards. Now, as there's lots of analysts who are studying Bitcoin, what they do is they develop these models. They look at historical performance, they look at how it's actually acted in the past, and try to assess when we may be entering one of these overheated or undervalued zones. Now, of course, there is no single answer to these things. Bitcoin is a volatile asset. It can move in any direction at any time. Markets are impossible to predict with any certainty. So really what we're going to look at here is a number of indicators ranging from simple moving averages all the way through to on-chain models. And what we're really looking for is a concept called confluence. When multiple indicators are telling a similar story, we can start to build up those probabilities. So there is no single tool. What we're really looking for is a confluence of events across a number of indicators all with different characteristics. So the first model that we're going to look at is called the investor tool. And this is one of these simple moving average based strategies. Now, what it does is it uses the two year moving average. This is a very, very long term moving average. You can see it here in the blue. It typically trades around the bottom end of Bitcoin's price action. We can see that in 2015, it really captured that late stage capitulation zone. We saw the price traded far above it. So it really extends away from that level during the bull market cycle and then returns to it again in the late stage bear here in 2018, back here in 2019 and March 2020. And here we are in our 2022 market where the price has yet again come back to revisit it. So this two year moving average typically behaves as somewhat of a bottom indicator. It provides us with that floor value that it really doesn't describe bull markets, but it does tend to describe some of the later stage bears. Now, the original author, Philip Swift, then also took a 5x multiple of this. So literally applying a 500% premium to that model. And what he found is that there was historical confluence with market tops. It doesn't pick the exact tops, but it does tend to pick out when we're starting to get this overheated behavior. It picked up both of these levels here in the 2013 bull. We started to run up against it in the late stage of the 2017, and then finally broke above it into this overheated territory. And then it provided that resistance yet again during the 2021 bull market. So again, you can see how even between these cycles, these metrics tend to change in the way that they perform and how Bitcoin actually responds to it. And there's also a layer of people becoming more aware of these tools over time. Sometimes they're in fashion, sometimes they're not. And you'll see that the market will change and evolve. So this is why we look at multiple indicators. But this is an indication of one of these first very, very simple uh, models based purely off a two-year moving average of price. Now, one of the very first topping models that was developed was actually by Willy Wu, who's built a many uh, an on-chain model over, over time. And this one isn't actually an on-chain model. This is looking at the average price of Bitcoin through all history. So take an average of Bitcoin's price from the day when it first had a, a trading indicator, a trading price, and then follow that average all the way through. And that's what we have in this blue curve here. This is the all-time average price. Now, what you can observe is that it generally plateaus during bear markets, and that's essentially because the price is more or less trading sideways. It will have a gentle slope to the upside, but then you'll see that as price starts to really move to the upside during bull markets, where we typically see these order of magnitude price increases, you can see that this really starts to expand, remembering that this is in logarithmic scale. So it's actually going through very, very steep inclines during this period of time. And these plateaus, whilst they look flat in linear space, are actually still quite significant because all of this time spent in the bear market is allowing that average price to overall catch up. 
Now, what Willy Woo found is that when you apply similar to the investor tool, he applied a 35X multiple to it. And what he noticed is that it started to pick these market cycle tops. We can see it here during the 2011 bull run. We can see it during these first two in 2013. It came up and retested it here in 2017. But note here in our 2021 bull market where we had a slightly different market structure. So you can see, similar to the investor tool, we had this somewhat diminishing return profile over time. This is as Bitcoin becomes larger in size, we see more money moving around the system, but that also means that it's much harder to extend into these very, very significant hype cycles to the up and to the downside. So what we've also applied here is the 15 times multiple. So this is showing you the sensitivity rather than a 30X, 35X multiple on the average price, we've applied a 13. You can see that it similarly catches not quite the tops, but certainly close to the tops of these previous cycles. And you can see that it provided resistance all the way through this period here. So what we're seeing is that we're again, we're looking at that double confluence now. We have the investor tool and we have the 15X top cap model to try and pick up when things are starting to get into that overhead range when it's extended somewhat too far from the all-time average price or in the model above the two-year moving average. This is starting to look like a bit of confluence. Now, a model that was quite popular during the 2021 cycle, and interestingly, if you were there for it, many people, even the author, didn't actually believe that it was uh, it was happening when we had this top appear here in April. And that is the Pi Cycle Top Indicator. And this is one of those ones that it really did, in fact, prove to be actually quite, uh, quite prescient. And many people actually ignored it because the excitement of the bull was too strong. Now, what we see here is this model is using a simple moving average of 111. So 111 days simple moving average is the blue curve here and you can see it's quite responsive. It tends to move alongside price. It's not too far away from the 100 day moving average. Now, in order to achieve a uh, relative ratio of 350 divided by this 111, we'll give you pi 3.153. Now, what we're essentially looking at here is this purple curve. This is the 350 day moving average multiplied by two. So the re again, this is developed based on trying to achieve this kind of natural number pi. It's kind of similar to the Fibonacci levels. We often see these natural numbers show up in market structure and human psychology. We see it show up in population densities, and all sorts of things. We see these natural numbers seem to reappear, whether through nature, but also through markets and various distributions. So what this model basically maps out is when this faster curve, the 111 SMA, when it moves above the slower moving two times 350 SMA, it has historically signal we're getting into some overheated territory. You can see twice here it triggered in red here in this 2013 bubble. We then saw the smaller moving average, the faster one moved duck down below and it spends quite a bit of time below that purple curve until finally they converge again near the cycle top. So you can see that historically it picked the 2013, it picked the 2017, and even though very, very few people believed it, it actually picked the 2021 cycle top as well. Now, as we just mentioned, things can go both to the upside and to the downside. These models tend to pick up when we see Bitcoin moving in an extreme in one side, it's often mirrored by an extreme back to the other side. So this purple curve down the bottom here is an oscillator that's taking the ratio between these two models. Now, what we've mapped out here is when it gets down to a point where the 111 SMA is trading at a 75% discount, so the gap between these two is now 75% in terms of price, of, um, price value, we've marked these out in green. Now, again, where we actually take these levels is completely arbitrary, but what we're looking at here is just one that seems to correlate quite well with where we've seen the market enter these late stage bear markets. So again, this faster moving average will descend much, much quicker. And generally after a big capitulation event in 2018, we saw a 50% price drop in, in the matter of one month. Back here in 2015, we also had a significant price drop and it stayed down there for over a year. So when we see these very significant price drops, the faster moving average will be much more responsive than the slower one. And therefore we can start to identify these extreme deviations and therefore start to build up that probability that perhaps we're moving into some form of bottom formation. So you can compare this again to the investor tool, which then also has that slower moving average down the bottom, the two year MA, and we start to look for confluence around market bottoms. And you can see how when we glue all these together, you're looking for multiple puzzle pieces telling you a similar story. Now, the Mayer multiple is one of these other indicators that's been around for a very, very long time. 
The Mayer multiple is derived as a ratio of price and the 200-day moving average. Now, the 200-day moving average is probably one of the most observed moving indicators in probably all of technical analysis. Many will look at the 200-day if price is above as an indication of a bullish market when it's below as an indication of a bearish market. It generally describes that line in the sand. And you'll typically see that the Bitcoin price, even before we had price charts back in 2013 and 2012, when you know it was much, much harder to actually observe these things, we didn't have trading view indicators back then for Bitcoin. What you will see is that the 200-day moving average still provided that psychological um, uh, mean reversion curve. People still responded to that 200-day moving average, even if they didn't realize that that's what was going on. There's something about human psychology that's really baked into this period of time. Now, what the Mayer multiple does, you can see here that we similarly have these cycles where it will oscillate down to very, very low values when it's below one. It means that price is trading at a discount to the 200-day moving average. When it's trading up here at these higher values, it means it's trading at a very high premium up here about 2.4 where this red curve is, is typically where we see markets start to hit some kind of resistance. This means that the price is trading at a 240% premium to the 200-day moving average. And as I noted, many traders, many investors, and even people psychologically seem to react to when they get into that degree of profit, but also to a degree of loss relative to that 200-day moving average. So you can see that it tends to describe these market cycles both to the upside and to the downside. And given that we look at these things in terms of a probability basis, so above 2.4, very, very few days in Bitcoin's history, something around 10% of all days have ever closed above 2.4. And likewise, around 20% of days have traded below 0.8. So the way to think about this is that that's showing you a relatively uncommon thing to happen. It can happen and it can carry on for some period of time. But we're starting to assess the probabilities of how likely these things are. So that's why these levels have been selected. And you can refer to the original write-up by Trace Mayer, which you'll find up here in this dashboard. You'll find the original write-up where he actually describes these extreme values. Now we can then convert that into an actual price band. You can see the blue curve, the, which is the 200-day moving average, the green curve, which is a 20% discount or a Mayer multiple of 0.8, and the red curve, which is then that 240% premium to the 200-day moving average. And you can see that it too provides these resistance topping models and bottoming models throughout these bulls and bears. So you can combine this as yet another model with all of those featured above. Now, the last one that we're going to look at is actually transitioning away. You may have noticed a lot of those are moving average based. They're actually based off simple MAs. Now, when we bring in the on-chain side of things, what we're looking at here is what we call the hash ribbon, or in more uh, better terms, the hash ribbon inversion is what we're looking at when it comes towards market lows. Now, what happens in the mining industry, it too goes through boom and bust because miners' income is denominated in BTC, but overall their revenue and their costs and ultimately what their investment is, is generally a return on investment in fiat denominated terms. Now, when markets go into a deeper bear market, typically an extended bear market, what we see is that some miners unfortunately invest at the wrong time, they don't have good capital management, and ultimately they at some point in time need to turn off their rigs if the market conditions get bad enough. Now, what this results in, where hash rate generally has been climbing over time, both in terms of more miners, more revenue available to them, more efficient hardware, at some periods of time, as you'll see out here marked in red, some of those miners must turn off their machines. Now, very similar to our Pi cycle indicator, where we have a faster and a slower moving average, we also have this applied here. We have a 30 day in purple and a 60 day in blue. And what we're essentially looking for is when that faster moving average ducks down below the slower one. That's showing that hash rate is coming offline. Some miners on a reasonable time frame, not daily noise, but on a reasonable 30-day time frame, are having to turn off their machines. And that is generally a result of financial stress. You can see that we typically get these red zones in 2015 near this market bottom. In 2012, again, this is very early. This is back when it was GPUs and CPU era. We're seeing that some of those rigs had to switch off during the bearish market. We can also see in the 2018 market, we started to get that bottoming signal as we collapsed down to the $3,000 range. We can see that March 2020, we had the initial 50% sell-off due to the COVID, uh, COVID scare. And then we also had the halving which came in. So we actually had price drop 50%, recover, and then the halving drop, which is another 50% drop in minor revenue. So it was almost a double halving. 
And we can also see here in May 2021, where we saw the great mining migration, where China essentially imposed a nationwide ban on, on Bitcoin mining, and over 50% of the hash rate had to switch off overnight. They suddenly incurred a lot of additional costs. They had to flush out their treasuries to pay their additional bills and essentially flushed out who are some of the most bullish on Bitcoin. The, the Bitcoin miners had to essentially um, sell as much as they needed to to cover their bills. And it was almost a complete purge of the system in terms of sellers. So we can see that this too is this on-chain model that's really mapping out and providing confluence with a number of the moving average models above. And that's really the secret source here, looking for multiple models across many different facets that all describe a similar thing. Now, once we move into the Glassnode Advanced Package, we actually have a number of other metrics that we can use. We can build in even more interesting concepts to try and track these market cycles. A good example is the MVRVZ score. This is one where we're actually tracking the market cost basis based on when coins have moved. And we can therefore look at when the market is in extreme profit up here in these red zones, and also when the market is now at an extreme loss, which typically correlates with these bottom formation patterns. So we can see that we can com combine that again with the models we've just looked at. We can look at things like entity adjusted dormancy flow. This is really tracking the overall market cap relative to whether it's older or younger coins coming back to life. Trying to find that balance of do we really have the conviction built into the market? Are we full of hodlers or are we actually seeing a transition of wealth towards more weaker hands who are less experienced in Bitcoin, which typically happens closer to market tops? We have reserve risk, which takes that really to the next level. It's looking at the hodling behavior. Are we seeing spending by the older hands or are we seeing that we're getting accumulation and hodling going on? This generally will signal very, very long accumulation bottoms. This is in log scale too. So this gets very reflexive as it rockets up into these overvalued zones. And you can see that it gets hauled down during these periods of, of deep accumulation, which can take time to play out, but it will show you that longer term overview of what the older hand hands versus the newer hands are typically doing. And then to close out, we have our re uh, realized HODL ratio, the R HODL ratio. Now, this one here is trying to map the balance of wealth between one-year-old coins and one-week-old coins. Again, capturing that old versus new money, experience versus inexperience, and trying to look for that overall weak hand versus strong hand behavior. So hopefully you found that useful. This is a bit of an overview of some of the many metrics that are available, um, just really scratching the surface on how we navigate these tops and bottoms. Again, the most important thing here is to look for confluence. We want to find multiple models that are telling the same story, and we're looking to try and build up that probability based on multiple metrics, some using simple moving averages, some using on-chain, and they can be of all different degrees of complexity. It's about finding the right tool for the right job and looking for many patterns that are showing the same outcome. So hopefully you found that useful and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Cheers.